Hangout. This is our second Hangout. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'm the Education Director for Sharks for Kids. And joining me today is Dr. Mickey McComb uh, Kobza from uh, the Oceans First Institute. So really excited to have her today. Mickey, can you say hi? Hi, everyone. Good morning. All right. So for those who are new to Sharks for Kids, um, our goal is to create a new generation of shark advocates by uh, empowering and encouraging students around the world to speak up because they can make a difference when they use their voice and they teach other people what they learn, especially about sharks in our oceans. So if you check out the Sharks for Kids website, we've got a wide variety of different curriculum, videos, interviews with scientists, fun posters, all kinds of great activities, so please do check that out. Um, if you do look at the sidebar, there's a little showcase tags. They're yellow, and there's a whole series of links. You can check out some different Sharks for Kids links, like our Twitter pages, Google+. Plus. Um, you can check out some links for Mickey, too, uh, for Oceans Classrooms and for the Oceans First Institute. So um, I want to take a moment to welcome our classes who are joining us today. So I'm going to switch over to them one by one, and if they want to say hi and wave as I introduce them, that would be awesome. So our first classroom is Mrs. Wyko's class from Manitou Springs, Colorado. And they're an energetic group of 25 second graders. They can see Pikes Peak from their classroom window. And they love history, science, and writing. You guys say hi. Hi. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Our second classroom is Mrs. Bennett's classroom. They're a first grade class joining us from Puyer, Missouri. Say hi. Hi. Awesome. Great group of kids. Thanks for joining us today. And our final class joining us is Mrs. DeGroote's third grade class. They're joining us from Skyline Elementary in Lake Stevens, Washington. Say hi. All right, thanks for joining us. So that's our awesome classrooms. We have several classrooms who are joining us um, to watch the live stream. So thank you for joining us. Um, please feel free to share questions on the event page or in the side chat bar. And after Mickey's lesson, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, also, say hi on the event page. Let us know who you are, where you're from, because we like to know who's uh, watching along. Um, even let us know how big your group is. So that's enough for me. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Mickey. And she's a marine biologist. She studies sensory biology and, and uh, physiology in sharks, rays, and skates. And she loves uh, teaching about sharks. She loves sharing her love of the ocean. And she's also the executive director of the Ocean First Institute. So. Mickey, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and uh, thank you all so much for having me in your classroom today. I'm uh, so excited to be here and uh, proud to be with uh, Sharks for Kids and, and trying to, uh, to let everyone know a little bit more about sharks and uh, to share uh, some of the secrets that I have learned about sharks over the years, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy uh, to, to be here and to, to be able to share that with you. So um, my name is Dr. Mickey, and uh, I really got excited about sharks when I was, uh, when I was a pretty young girl. And uh, it started for me uh, when I was about seven years old, and I've really been on this journey ever since trying to understand what it's like to be a shark in the ocean and how they make a living, how do they experience their world and what are some of their secrets. And it's been an amazing journey. I've been all over the world working with amazing people who are passionate and talented and are really trying to help us understand sharks and, and most importantly help us understand ways that we can protect them uh, because sharks are a very important part of a healthy ocean. And so what I want to do now is just share some really uh, great images of sharks with you, talk about the, the beautiful ones and the weird ones, and uh, share some of their adaptations uh, and talk a little bit about uh, what, what they're like. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start doing that. So I'm going to try to 
share my screen and and let's see if we can do that. So, um, can everyone see the screen I'm sharing? Yep, looks good on my end. Great. Okay, so um, I actually grew up in Colorado, so a big shout out to those of you in Colorado that can see Pikes Peak. That's pretty amazing. Um, it's my home. I grew up in the mountains and was an avid outdoor explorer as a, as a young girl. And, you know, uh, my, my love of the ocean came about in a strange way. When I was seven years old, I saw the movie Jaws, and it scared me so bad. Um, here I am with my brother and his friends. Um, we were all shark fanatics. And, you know, the fear that I had of sharks led me to read a lot about them and to try to understand why I was so scared. I thought they were under the um, bed, I thought they were in the carpet, uh, I thought they were in the swimming pool, so it was really hard for me <laughs> to, uh, to deal with it and reading about sharks led me to understand that they aren't the monsters um, that they are portrayed as in so many of the movies. So I'm sure many of you um, might have seen Jaws and, and maybe some of you have seen movies like Sharknado, um, which are really quite ridiculous and they're made to entertain us, but they do um, scare us in some ways and I think they bring out um, the ridiculous um, in our perceptions of sharks. And so I think for my life I've wanted to understand what sharks are really like. and what they really do um, in their environment. And again, that's really led for me to a path uh, that has been so incredible. And so my dream was to um, share what I learned and what I've seen um, in the world of sharks with people. And that led me to become a scuba diver, uh, to share space with sharks. And, you know, the ocean is the last great wilderness on Earth. And when you go scuba diving, um, you really are um, in the biggest wilderness that is unexplored on our planet, and there is never a same dive twice. And uh, sharing that space with sharks and introducing sharks and people together was a big passion of mine um, for a very long time, and I was able to um, learn more about how sharks behave and what they're like in the water, and to bring people with me to see that sharks weren't the monsters that we, we thought they were. I, I was able to go diving with great whites in Africa, and despite the picture and sort of what everyone thinks, the sharks that I saw, uh, the great whites, were afraid of my bubbles. <laughs> so they were um, very uh, shy and timid, um, which was such a surprise to me. Uh, so I, uh, I had a wonderful experience trying to uh, get close and, and experience sharks for myself. And that, um, that love and passion translated into me wanting to uh, learn more, and I ended up going to pursue a research um, career and wanted to understand sharks um, through science. And so I uh, spent time as a scientist learning about sharks' hormones and learning about how hormones um, can change the growth and the, the life of sharks, and it is something we're still trying to understand. But many of the hormones that you and I have, sharks also have, and they play similar roles. And so the work that I did was trying to understand how some of those hormones work. And it allowed me to work in the field and uh, to work in the lab to try to answer some very um, interesting questions. This is me with a, a shark in tonic immobility. So when sharks are turned upside down, uh, they will go into a state of uh, tonic immobility. And this is oftentimes used by researchers to uh, work on sharks. It makes them uh, a lot easier to work uh, on. We don't know really how tonic immobility works, but it is a useful um, way for us to work on sharks. And, we, uh, we, we have some ideas on, on why sharks have this, and we think it might have to do with mating, and we're trying to understand that a little more. I'm going to um, skip on. I spent some time working on uh, freshwater stingrays in the Amazon. Um, there are beautiful stingrays that are uh, all over the, uh, the Amazon River and into 
areas of flooded forest and many of these uh, rays are taken out to be part of aquariums and many of the ray species are taken out before they can be described by science and so I uh, was able to spend many months in the Amazon trying to help understand these stingrays and ways to protect them. Um, and then I went uh, to get a PhD at Florida Atlantic University where I studied sensory biology and this was trying to understand how sharks see, how they smell, um, how they use a secret uh, sense that I'll talk about in, in, a, in a few minutes, the electro sense, um, and trying to understand how they use all those senses in combination. So that's a little bit about my story and, and what I've done. I want to talk now about the most important thing, which is, uh, is the sharks and their remarkable history. So sharks uh, and skates and rays are all closely related and they're cartilaginous so if you touch the end of your nose or your ears um, you're able to uh, feel cartilage and that's what the skeletons um, of shark skates and rays are made of and it's very bendable so they're closely related and sharks and skates and rays have been around for a very long time um, longer than the dinosaurs and uh, they have gone into many different habitats on the planet, including the brightly lit coral reefs to the muddy waters of the Amazon, um, to the polar regions. This is a Greenland shark um, that is living in the polar regions and has special um, adaptations that allows it to live there, and, and, it's, and it's okay. And there are also many shark species that live in the deep dark, benthos, where no sunlight can even penetrate. This is a frilled shark, and what you can see here are its teeth that are, adapta that are adapted for feeding in the, in the deep, and its eyes, which are also um, allowing it to see as much as it can in that dark habitat. So there are over 400, actually over 500 shark species um, that we know of and we're discovering more um, every month. Um, science is uh, a process of discovery and so we're learning more um, every day. So um, what I'd like to do is just show you a few um, of the shark species and then I'm going to stop and I'm going to show you uh, some, uh, some other things that I have here to share today. So I'm, I'm wondering if many of you have seen this before. This is the whale shark. Uh, the whale shark is the biggest fish in the ocean. So it's the largest fish. It's a shark. It's not a whale. And it is um, a, a, a filter feeder. So it actually takes plankton out of the water. Um, one of the smallest, almost microscopic organisms is what it feeds on. And it is the largest fish in the ocean. And uh, this is how it, it has an open mouth here. And this is how it filters out those tiny plants and animals, um, which are full of energy. As you can imagine, something so small can uh, help create a whale shark, which is so big. And this picture is really neat. It's boats from the air right here and here. And all over uh, the water are the whale sharks. And there's, there are hundreds of them. Um, so at any given time, whale sharks swim together and uh, feed on big blooms um, of food. And you can uh, snorkel with whale sharks if you wanted to, and they're harmless. So to go from the biggest to the smallest, this is the dwarf lantern shark. So you can see it can fit in the palm of your hand. And it's a deep sea shark. And it has adaptations that allow it to be successful underwater in the deep. But one of the neatest things is there are glow-in-the-dark sharks. It's incredible. This is a velvet belly lantern shark. And this green under its belly is what is called bioluminescence. This shark glows in the dark. And it does that because it tries to camouflage its body um, so that predators won't see it. So it's a strategy the shark uses um, to hide. 
and it uses chemicals to create light in the deep, dark um, ocean. So uh, an amazing adaptation we see in this um, small shark. So I'm going to stop for one second, um, and I'm going to go back to um, share some, some other things with you. So um, can everyone hear me OK, and we're, are we doing OK? At the classes, I have them on mute, but if you want to give a thumbs up, the students, so we can see. Okay. Them there. Okay. Great. Great. That's good. Right. <laughs> um, so I want to shift gears for just one second. Um, I'd like to show you. Um, so remember, one of the neat things is when you think about the dinosaurs, you know, you really think about something that's very, very old. But you know what? When we think about the sharks, you know, in truth, they are older than the dinosaurs, and they do have um, amazing adaptations that have allowed them to be very successful. And so one of the things that I'd like to show you that's very important for a shark um, are its teeth. So this is the jaw of a sandbar shark. And what I want you to see up close here are its teeth and the shape of the tooth. So the tooth can tell us a lot about what sharks are eating and how they make a living. And so this particular shark has very pointed teeth and it uses those to catch things like fish. And if I flip the jaw over, what I want you to be able to see is there's almost uh, like a conveyor belt of teeth. So as you lose teeth, you'll get one more set of adult teeth. But sharks keep getting teeth. And it's important because sharks don't have hands. They need to be able to pull food into their mouth and keep it. And so here we have um, this conveyor belt of teeth. And that allows sharks to always have a really nice set of sharp teeth, which which they can feed. So that's one type of tooth, but I want to share with you another kind. So take a look at this. So this is the jaw of a large tiger shark. And so tiger sharks look like this. So they've got stripes on them. That's why they call them tiger sharks. And what's neat about it is look at the shape of this tooth. Look at that. So it's very, very different. And that gives us clues that the shark is eating something and it's uh, got a very special shape. And the tiger shark, um, its favorite food, I would ask you if you know what it is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually uh, show you right now. The, this is called almost like a can opener tooth. Um, the other one that I showed you is like a needle. And this one, this is why, whoops, let me hold that up like this. That's why this. Tiger shark's favorite food are, are turtles. They use the that tooth to be able to cut open the shells. And so that's that special adaptation we see in their teeth. And then I'd like to show you just one more. This tiny jaw right here is from a zebra shark. And it's got kind of flat teeth, like a like a mallet or a hammer. And the main reason why is it's food. Um, these Sharks like to eat things like this, like crabs. And so that allows them to really crack those open. And again, it's a big way, it's a way for us to understand um, what these sharks are eating. All right, everybody, hold on to your seatbelts. Here's a really big tooth. Check this out. So, does anyone have any idea what shark this might have come from? I yeah. don't know if you know. I'm going to switch over to a class. <laughs> okay. Take a guess. I'm going to go to uh, Mrs. DeGroote's class. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Does anybody know? So, Logan, take a guess. Uh, great white. It's a cousin, a very closely related species to the great white. We, we don't see them anymore, but I just betcha someone knows what it is. Isaiah, take a guess. I'm hold on. Yes, that's great. Yes, yes perfect. Um, this is Cacaridon megalodon. So Cacaridon megalodon looks like this. This is incredible. This is a great white shark, and that's the megalodon. So the megalodon was uh, thought to reach lengths of 60 feet, as big as a school bus, and had a jaw full of teeth this big. Um, so you can see how big that is. And we think that megalodons um, were eating whales. So they were eating very big, big animals in the ocean. And they went extinct about 10 million years ago. And we don't know why. We just don't know. We think something changed 
in the environment or something happened and we just don't know what it is, but we know that megalodons are no longer there. So an interesting, uh, an interesting thing for us to, to talk about and, and think about. So I'm going to share a few more uh, species with you. So I'm going to try to share my screen again. Here I go. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. So how many of you, I wonder, have seen this shark before? This one is called the goblin shark. So the goblin shark is a very strange um, shark head shape. It's got a very long nose, which is also called a rostrum. And if you look at the teeth and the jaws, um, it's interesting the jaws are not fused to the shark's skull, and they can actually protrude out. Um, the goblin shark isn't much more attractive from the front, I'm afraid. You can see it's got some snaggly tooth, but these are like needle teeth. And again, they're pointed backwards to allow the goblin shark to get its fish prey and be able to hold them. And what I want to show you, and I hope this works. Oh, I don't know if it's going to work. I was going to show you a quick, um, uh, a quick uh, video of a, of a goblin shark, but essentially what happens is the jaws are able to come out um, and protract out. So it's a, it's a great adaptation that goblin sharks have um, in order to get food. So here is uh, a picture of the megalodon, um, just so that you can see what the megalodon look like. All right, and then here is... Is there a question? Um, don't see any hands. Okay, no problem. Um, okay. So uh, the mako shark is um, another shark I'd like to talk briefly about. It is um, closely related to the great white, um, but it's got a very special um, adaptation. Um, it has eyes that are superheated. Um, its eyes are very important because it chases fast-moving prey, and its eyes are actually heated um, so that they work as fast as they can, even in cold water. So it's a special adaptation we see to help mako sharks um, see and see very well. Um, this is another, uh, this is a, a pelagic shark. So this is a shark that spends most of its time out in the open ocean. <clears throat> it's called the blue shark. Um, it's very much a torpedo shaped, um, also called hydrodynamic shape. Um, and we see blue sharks all over the globe. This is another pelagic shark. Um, it's called the oceanic white tip. This shark is oftentimes uh, found at um, Navy disasters. It has good hearing, and um, it has white tips, and oftentimes people remember um, seeing them because of that color, and they're very easy to see and remember. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead for one second here, and I'd like to... Um, I just would like to share with you a, a little bit about the, the research that I've done, and I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about the sensory systems of sharks. And um, so sharks have um, all of the same sensory systems that you and I do. Um, so sharks have a lateral line that allows them to detect vibrations and movement in the water, just like a regular fish. Um, this is a snook, so you can see that line going down the body. So uh, fish like this are called bony fish. They have that line, and sharks have it too. But what about ears? Can sharks hear? Do sharks have ears? Well, that's a great question, and in fact they do. They have um, holes slightly set back from their eyes, and they have bones very similar to our bones in our ears. And sound travels faster in water, so sharks can hear, and they can hear very well. But what about their sense of taste? Don't sharks eat garbage cans and things like that and license plates? Well, you know what? We really don't know much about the sense of taste in sharks. Um, we, we know they have taste buds all around their mouths, but we don't really know um, how well they taste, so it's something somebody could learn more about. Um, we know they have a very good sense of smell, 
um, but no better than other fish. So they're not the super smellers that everyone thinks that they are. Um, they can um, smell blood in the water, which is coming from wounded prey. That's similar to you and me smelling cookies, uh, fresh baked cookies if I brought them into the room. Um, it works uh, in a very similar way. Um, and, and that's uh, that's how that works. So um, sharks have, uh, they're not called nostrils, they're called nares. And uh, that's uh, the way that they are able to, to smell. Studies have shown that they react more to fish blood than they do human blood. And that's because humans aren't typically in the water with sharks that often. And then the last thing I'd like to mention is the visual system. So sharks do have the ability to see and see very well. Sharks also have what are called mobile pupils. Just means their eyes can dilate. Um, other bony fish like that uh, snook I just showed you can't do that. So shark eyes are very advanced and they allow them to see in dim light and they also have built-in sunglasses. They have these structures that can come down and protect their eyes from bright light. And great white sharks often roll their eyes back um, when they're attacking to protect their eyes. And then the very last thing I'd like to talk about is a very special sense, and it's one that I've spent many years studying, and it's called the electrosense. So you're looking now at the snout of a great white shark, and these little dots that look like pepper all over his nose, those are called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And they allow the sharks to detect weak electric fields. So you might be saying to yourself, what's that? What's a weak electric field? Well, every living thing that's in the ocean gives off a weak electric field. So, for example, this fish. If you see this fish in the water, its gills are moving, and it's giving off um, a weak electric field, and the sharks can detect it. So um, it's, a, it's a very close range sense, and one of the things that we studied is, you know, what if you've got a shark like this who has that ability to detect electric fields? It uses that to find hidden fish and crabs in the sand and coral, but what about if you have another type of shark like this one, and I think everybody knows what this is, right? So this is a hammerhead shark. So the hammerheads have that same ability to detect electric fields, but their head is about three feet wide. So the question is, do you think that a hammerhead versus a pointed nose shark, which of these would have a better chance of finding prey, or is one better than the other? And you know what, we found that the uh, sharks are just about the same in their sensitivity, but by having a huge head, you're like having a big metal detector. And we think that gives hammerheads an advantage over normal sharks. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. And, and the, the one thing I'd like to share about hammerheads is there's more than one, just one species of hammerhead. There are over 10. Um, we just discovered a new one uh, not too long ago. And hammerheads have... Um, a head expansion that goes from slight in one species to extreme um, in another and everything in between. So they're fascinating and they, they recently evolved only about uh, 10 million years ago. So they're the newest sharks in the ocean and we're still trying to understand why they have this weird head shape. Um, so yeah, I think I've hit my, my mark, maybe what we can do is take a little break here and have some questions. I think that might be a great great idea and we can just see where we go. That sounds great. Thank you for all that information and all those pictures and visuals. That was great. I really like looking at the different size jaws, so those were awesome visuals. Um, before we start doing some questions, I just want to give a shout out to a couple classrooms who have checked in. So. Um, Two Canadian classrooms. I have one in Drayton Valley, Alberta, and there are two third grade classes, and then I've got a fourth grade class, Mr. Wigmore's class from Brampton, Ontario, so welcome. We also have a third grade class from Shipley School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, watching along, as well as a fourth grade class in Athens, Georgia, looks like Mrs. Taylor's class, and uh, Mrs. Hartman's class in San Francisco, a second grade class. So. Thank you, everybody who's joining. 
So I'm going to cycle through a few of um, our classrooms and we can ask some questions. So maybe I'll go to Mrs. Bennett's class first. How's everybody doing over there? Good. All right. Do you have some questions for Dr. Mick? Okay. Why do hammerhead sharks have eyes on each side of their head? That is a great question. So if you look at this hammerhead, you can see its eyes are on the stone. And so one of the questions that I had about hammerhead is what do they see? Can they even see straight ahead when they're swimming through the water? And you know what I found out? I found out that they can see straight ahead. And the main reason why is their eyes are actually on the ends and pointed slightly forward. And so we think that hammerheads having their eyes on the end of the hammer have a bit of an advantage in having depth perception. So that just means when you look at your finger in front of your head, you see it moving away and to you. And that's what hammerheads have too. They have depth perception because their eyes are set so far apart. Thank Good you question. for helping me with my answer. Sure. You're welcome. Do we have another question? Alex. What are ways sharks are important? So sharks are very important, and I like to oftentimes use um, another story that can, I think, bring it, uh, bring it home a little better, and that is when you think about wolves, so wolves on, uh, in Yellowstone Park, we took wolves away because we were afraid of wolves, and it changed that entire ecosystem, and it changed it in ways we could not predict. In the same way, when we remove sharks from the ocean in numbers um, that are not sustainable, um, we're impacting the marine ecosystem in ways we can't predict. And uh, there are many scientists like myself who are concerned that we're taking out more sharks than can be replaced. Um, and, and we're taking too many too fast. And we're very concerned about the impacts that that will have on the ocean. And we believe strongly that a healthy ocean needs predators. So thank you for your question. Thank you for helping me find out my answer. All right, and we'll grab one more from your class. Riley, come here. How do sharks breathe underwater? How do sharks? How do sharks breathe underwater? That's a wonderful question. And I just happen to have something that I think will help me show you. So you know how you're breathing right now? You're breathing oxygen from the air. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to show you a little model. Ah, so this is, um, this is a great white shark. So you can see here he is on the outside. But what I want to do is show you what he looks like on the inside. And right here are his gills. So sharks use gills, and they run water over their gills, and they take out the oxygen from the water. So they're doing the same thing you're doing. They just do it underwater, and they use gills that are just similar to your lungs. And that's how they do it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks for those awesome questions. We're going to switch to another class, but on our way over, I'm going to take a question that came in on the event page. So this question is from Mrs. Hartman's second grade class in San Francisco, and they're wondering, why do humans kill sharks? You know, that's a, a fascinating question, and it's one that's been happening for a very long time. But the biggest um, uh, impact on sharks right now is from overfishing, and the main target um, of this overfishing is for one thing, and uh, that's for uh, the fins of sharks. And so there is a big demand um, in the world for the fins of sharks. And so uh, what happens is uh, people cut the fins off the sharks and then send the sharks overboard, um, and unfortunately they don't survive. And the fins are used to make a soup called shark fin soup. And shark fin soup is a delicacy and a status symbol in Asia and many people pay a lot of money for it and so that demand for shark fin soup has driven an unsustainable um, take of sharks from our oceans and that's um, 
of, again, great concern uh, for, for all of us. But I have to say there is great news. The demand for shark fin soup is, is declining, and we're seeing some great results from campaigns like Sharks for Kids and other organizations that are fighting to let people know that this is not something that we support and something that we can, uh, we can change, we can turn the tide. All right. Let's go to uh, Mrs. Wyko's class. I'm just going to turn on your microphone. How is everybody? Yay! All right, you got some questions? Can or do people clean sharks to do so that people can touch the sharks? Can you ask that one more time? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. No. Can or do people train sharks to do so that people can touch the sharks? Yeah, so, um, yes, sharks um, have an intelligence, um, probably on par of, a, of your, your, your dog, and um, studies have been done that have shown that sharks can learn, and they can press rewards um, for food, they can go into mazes and learn mazes, so sharks are not, sharks are smarter than we think, and many uh, people that work in the Bahamas um, do dives with sharks, and they get close to sharks, and some people say they have relationships with sharks, and um, spend time um, touching them and, uh, and, and petting them, uh, and, and it happens. So uh, I think the, the entire uh, idea of what sharks are has been changing through pictures and through people who are trying to tell their story. So yes, I think sharks are smart. And I think that we're learning more about them every day. Thank you. Good question. How many sets of teeth do whale sharks have? Ah, so that's a great question. So I happen to have a whale shark right here. And whale sharks are filter feeders. So they do have teeth, but the way that they feed is through little filter pads that are on the inside of their mouth. And so they are um, like a big spaghetti sieve. They're sieving out um, all of the little plankton, little microscopic organisms, and they're feeding on those. Those are high energy packets, and they sustain a body that's as big as a bus. Uh, and so they don't have teeth like uh, we think of with uh, our sandbar shark. Um, they've got something very different, and they use those filter pads um, to feed. Thank you for helping me with my question. Of course, thank you. How long can a bull, bull shark live? How long can a bull shark live? Well, that's a great question. Um, bull sharks, and and, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually say two things. Bull sharks are special because we know that they're osmo regulators. That means they can go into fresh water. Um, the lifespan of a bull shark is in the 20 years. Um, could be a little bit more. We're still learning a lot about age and growth um, on different populations of bull sharks. Um, we have bull sharks that are in uh, Lake Nicaragua. We have them in the Everglades. I've been out on airboats, and I've seen juvenile bull sharks right next to the boat. So um, they are an amazing shark with a, a very special adaptation. And we think that Many of the female bull sharks give birth to small pups in fresh water to protect them from being um, eaten by other sharks. So it's a very important adaptation. All right, great questions. And let's move over now, check in on Mrs. DeGroote's class. Hi, gang. Can you hear us over there? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Why do sharks have a fin on top of their body? Ah, okay. So, question is, why do sharks have a fin on top? So, if you think about it, if you look at this, we almost have um, a triangle here. And so, what happens is the fins help with pitch and yaw and roll. So, when a shark is swimming through the water, it's using its tail to propel itself, and it's using its dorsal fin and its other fins um, that it has to, to swim through the water. 
And so it, it uses that to balance out so it doesn't pitch and yaw. Um, so that's why they have them. And, you know, what's interesting, too, just as a little aside, not every single shark has to continually swim to stay alive. And there are many different species of shark that can pump water over their gills, and it allows them to rest on the bottom. And one of those is the white tip shark. And you can see the white tip shark here. So they can actually use uh, their, their pectoral fins and, and rest on the bottom, which is really, uh, really neat to see. You can see them in caves sleeping. Why do sharks have so many adaptations? Ah, that's fantastic. That's why I love studying them. Um, it's because they've had a long time um, to interact and, and go through the process of, of, of natural selection. Um, they, they respond to their environments. And as I mentioned before, they have found themselves in almost every aquatic environment on the planet. And with 400 million years of history, they have responded to an ever-changing environment, and that's why we see such incredible adaptations in things like their color, their, their camouflage, um, the way that their eyes work and the shape. Um, they're uh, a really incredible group to study because of their adaptations. It keeps us guessing and learning. It's wonderful. That's a great question. Thank you. Can sharks swim but get tired? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, um, again, some sharks don't have to continually swim, uh, but many of them do, and we're just trying to understand now how they do it. How do they go to sleep? Um, we're, we're trying to understand how they shut down parts of their brain. Um, I don't know that they get tired. Um, I think that that's part of uh, the, the process of being a shark, and we know they use their vertebral column to swim, and uh, they're, they're probably able to, to, to shut off parts of their brain while they're swimming so that they can uh, sleep. So a lot of mysteries, uh, and, and we're still discovering uh, things every day about them. So that's a, that's a great question. Okay, good question. Um, I'm going to take a look at a few questions we have that have just come in on the event page, and then maybe we can swing back to the classrooms for another question or two. Um, first, I want to say... I'm excited. There's a lot of Canadian classes who have joined in today, so I'm actually located in Guelph, Ontario. So the Brampton class is really close by, and there's a 4-5 uh, Mr. Wilson's class in Allison, Ontario. That's not too far away. Uh, we've got a fourth grade class in Edmonton. But the question I have uh, for right now is from Mrs. Jones' kindergarten class. They're in Newfoundland, Pennsylvania, and they're wondering, can sharks blink? Ooh, that's a great question. Okay, so... Um, some sharks, um, for example, lemon sharks and others, um, have, uh, and I can't really show you, but I'll put up a little um, stuffed animal here, but they have what's called a nictitating membrane. It's a third eyelid on the shark. And so if you go close to the shark's eye and you touch the skin, you'll see a little eyelid come out and it covers the eye. And so it's like a shark is blinking. Um, not all sharks have nictitating membranes. Um, but some of them do, and they use that to protect their eye. Because, again, remember, um, sharks have to eat with their mouths, and they eat things that can try to fight back, um, things like seals and crabs, and they want to protect their eyes. They're very important. Um, great white sharks are a little bit different in that they roll their entire eye back, and you see the white of the sclera of their eye when they roll back right before a bite. Um, so some have that third eyelid, and some actually roll their eyes back. Okay, good stuff. Um, let's go to Canada, Brampton, Ontario, Mr. Wigmore's class. Um, let's see. Well, here's a personal question. What's your favorite shark? Ooh, that's so hard. Um, geez. You know, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's got to probably be the hammerhead. Um, I'm, I'm working on uh, the scalloped hammerhead right now in Costa Rica, and we're trying to figure out how to protect them. They're being used by fishermen in this one particular area as bait, and we're trying to find a way to uh, prevent that because we think that this young juvenile nursery area um, is the source population to the sharks we see in Cocos and Galapagos Islands, where you see hundreds of hammerheads schooling together. Um, so we're trying to connect the dots 
and to protect that very important population of hammerhead sharks. Okay, we'll grab one more question from them. It was, what's the deepest depth that a shark can swim at? You know, we're not positive, but we think around 6,000 feet. Um, so if you think when you fly in an airplane, you're about 35,000 feet off the ground, that's just about how the deepest ocean is. It's around 37,000 feet. So we think that sharks are found anywhere around the six to 7,000 foot mark, but we're not sure. Um, you know, the thing to keep in mind is that we've only explored about 5% of the ocean. So there's so much more that we don't know and that we will learn in your lifetime. So I'm excited for you. There's so much that you'll learn and find out. It's an exciting time. It sure is. Um, I'm going to cycle back to our classrooms. Let's get some live questions. So let's uh, go right back to the beginning with Mrs. Bennett's class. Do you have maybe one more question you'd like to ask? Uh, Dr. <laughs> How many teeth do sharks have? Yeah, you know, uh, sharks can have thousands of teeth over their lifetime. So look at this tiger shark jaw. And when I flip it over, um, if you can see closely, I'll get real super close here, you can see there's many more teeth behind that one. And so as these teeth are, are shed and fall out, um, the shark has more. So it can be thousands of teeth in a lifetime. And shark teeth fossilized pretty well, and that's why we're able to find things like this um, that let us know a little bit about the history and the past of sharks. And again, the shape of the tooth can tell us so much about what they eat and how they make a living. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Thank you for answering my question. Okay, and um, just before we go in between, you showed the megalodon tooth again. We actually have a question from the 4 or 5 class in Alliston, Ontario. They're wondering, if the megalodon's extinct, how do we know what they look like? You know, that's a great, um, that's a great question, and really is through a reconstruction um, of their teeth, which is the one thing that fossilizes, fossilizes well. Um, if we're lucky, um, sometimes we'll actually find um, an entire skeleton of a shark, but it's very rare. Um, simply because of um, the, the fact that they're made of cartilage. So again, sharks have uh, you know bones um, that you can see, but they're they're skeletons, but they're cartilaginous skeletons. And so when we recreate um, what we think megalodons look like, we do it based on um, what we see in extant or alive species. And so when I look at uh, a tooth, let me show you here um, of a you Sorry, can. Mickey, just to stop you for a moment. Oh, no, your picture's back. Never mind. Great, We're that's good. a great white tooth of a, of, a, of a live great white, and it's very similar um, to what we see um, with megalodon, and that's how we can reconstruct um, what some of these species look like. It's a fantastic question. Okay, let's go back to Mrs. Uh, Wojko's class. You have another question for Mickey? Um, what is the fastest shark in the world? You know, one of the fastest sharks that we, we know is the Mako shark. And you know, um, if do we have time to watch a really quick video? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. The video come through. Let me no, see. It should. Okay, let me share, and I'm gonna pull this up real quick here. Um, let me see if I can get this. Um, let me just get this real quick. Hold on. So this is um, a Mako shark swimming. This is the shark that I mentioned um, that actually superheats its eyes. So you're looking at a camera that's mounted on the back of a boat. And um, what's happening is it's got fish trailing off some lines. That's a mako coming in, swimming after a very fast-moving boat. And so imagine um, this is what a, a mako shark would do when it's trying to chase tuna or other fast-moving fish, and that's what it does. And so you can imagine, I mean, if you look at him, watch him come in again here. He's swimming so fast, and he's coming in after something that's small and moving. So his eyes have to work, and they have to work well. 
and his teeth have to be able to hold on to that fish, and he's got to be able to then open his jaw and swallow it. Um, so there's a lot going on in a really fast, um, uh, a very you know, very quickly. And uh, you know, this is the fastest uh, shark um, in the ocean that we know of. Um, it's the mako. They are incredibly fast. So there you go. <laughs> good, good question. Uh, got a question from the fourth grade class in Georgia. This is Taylor's class. And they're just wondering about um, how long sharks can live. So that's uh, a really great question, and you know we just got um, some information back on a few different species that are telling us that sharks may live as long as 70 years, um, but it depends on the species. Um, so it, some sharks, like some of the smaller hammerheads, may only live to 12 to 15 years, uh, but other species are more long-lived and can live up to 70 years. So it really depends on the species. Okay. And let's uh, check back in with uh, Mrs. DeGroote's class. Have another question for us? What row of teeth do sharks use for eating? Um, so again, um, they're going to be using the top, uh, top furthest row out um, to go ahead and catch that prey. And you know, the only time I ever got bit by a shark was from a shark jaw. <laughs> <laughs> that I had in my car. So, uh, and, it, and it just is because it's that outer, uh, outer edge of teeth um, that are so sharp and ready to go, and that's what the sharks use. Thank you. Um, Thank great. you. So we have a few more minutes. Does your class have another question they'd like to ask? Um, no, it was Dahlia's question. Yes, we do. Perfect. Um, Dahlia, hurry up. Let's go. Let's go, kiddo. <laughs> There's your question. What parts of the shark protect it from predators? Oh, um, you know that's a that's a great question, and I guess they can bring in something like this to say that um, sharks use camouflage um, in many ways to be able to hide from predators. So this is a a camouflage adaptation. And one of the other things that you'll notice on many of the other sharks is they have sort of this change in coloration around the middle of their body, and that's called counter shading. And so we'll see that they're dark on top, so if you, you were looking down upon them, they kind of blend in. But if you looked up at them from below, they would blend into the sky and to the lighter area. So that's called counter shading, and that's a mechanism um, to try to keep the sharks um, not only hidden from prey, so they have the element of surprise, but also allowing them to um, conceal themselves from potential predators. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Before I switch back to a live class, I have a question from... Uh, Mr. Wigmore's class in Brampton, Ontario, and it's, do we know what the largest uh, species population of sharks is? Huh. Uh, you know, that's a great question, um, and I don't know the answer to that. So I don't know. I think um, at one time blue sharks were quite numerous, uh, but uh, unfortunately blue sharks, because of their long fins, have been targeted uh, by shark finners. Um, so I don't know. That's a great question. I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> All right. Um, Mrs. Wyko's class, does, do your students have another question for us? Do hammerheads wreck boats? Do hammerheads wreck boats? Yes. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I think that uh, sometimes we see... Um, pictures or video or hear stories about how um, sharks sometimes go um, next to boat motors and we think what's happening is there's a weak electric field um, that comes off the motors. Um, I've had sharks come up while I've done filming and um, come to my camera uh, because again it is sending out a weak electric um, field. So I think they're attracted to that and that's why they come in so that could be um, could be one of the reasons um, that sharks come to investigate. Thank you. That's a great question. Okay. And Mrs. Bennett's class. You have another question for us? Why do, why 
Why do sharks jump up in the air to catch their prey? Okay, so one of the sharks that's known for um, jumping in the air is the great white. Um, great white sharks are ambush predators, and so great white sharks use the element of surprise. And so what will happen is there will be um, a seal, um, perhaps on the surface, and great whites will come in, and they'll take a huge bite, uh, and then they'll move away. Um, and they do that because they want to protect themselves, um, and they'll just let the seal um, go ahead and... And, uh, and, and, and die and, and then come back and feed on it. Um, but many times the sharks will jump out of the water and, uh, and, and that's part of their capacity as an ambush predator. We also see spinner sharks that jump out of the water, um, you know, eight feet, uh, huge jumps, and it's uh, pretty incredible to see. So many, many species do. And one of the unique things is that we think great whites will sometimes stick their head out of the water to look around. It's called spy hopping. Um, and it's something that we see in great whites, and uh, it's pretty remarkable to think of such a big fish taking a look around um, in the air. Hey, good question. So I can't believe it, but that hour has flown <laughs> by. Uh, I feel like I just hit start on the broadcast. That was some great information that was. Awesome, awesome questions. Can't thank you enough for uh, spending some time with us here today on our Sharks for Kids uh, Marine Science Hangout. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it so much. I, I, I love it and, uh, and hope you enjoyed it too. Okay. So uh, first of all, huge thank to every, uh, thanks to everybody who was watching uh, in Canada and the United States. And um, please, if you did watch, uh, send us a message on the event page just so we... Uh, we know who was with us today. Um, please check out Sharks for Kids. Follow us on Twitter, Google. Uh, awesome pictures and videos on Instagram as well as YouTube. So if you check out the showcase bar, you can find some links. You can also check out some links to see some of uh, Mickey's work uh, with the Ocean's First Institute as well as Ocean's Classrooms. Um, as well, this event recorded directly to YouTube, so you can check it out later. You can share it with other classrooms. That would be amazing to share the knowledge that we learned today. So um, again, huge thank you. And uh, Mickey, if you want to say something to the classrooms. Uh, you know, I'd just like to say that uh, you, know, uh, you are the future and your knowledge um, inspires me. I know many of you know a lot about sharks and uh, you've had really smart questions and uh, you inspire me to believe that we have a really uh, great possibility of sharks surviving uh, on our planet and thriving again. And uh, sharks in our ocean, uh, to me, means that we will have a healthy ocean. And I think with students like you that care and know, um, that's a very, very real possibility. And that excites me. And I just want you to know that I'm very grateful and thankful. And I hope that you share that word and tell your friends and your parents um, that sharks are important. And uh, thank you so much for your time. And, uh, and have, have a great day. Okay, so thanks again, and uh, don't forget, we do this once a month with uh, marine science uh, scientists, so we have a big, big, exciting one for March. We're going to make an announcement soon, so stay tuned for that because you're not going to want to miss it. So thanks again. Uh, everybody have a great weekend, and um, share your knowledge. Tell someone what you learned about sharks today because that's the best way to uh, make sure we can protect them. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a great one.